Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome, everybody, to another Lazy CEO podcast. My name is Jim Schlexer. I am your host. I'm also the founder of the CEO Project. Um, well, today you just get me. We had a couple of guests the last few uh, conversations, and they have been awesome. Um, but today you get me, um, and, and that's okay, hopefully. So don't turn off your radios uh, or turn off your podcast. So today we're going to talk about uh, stock. And, you know, for those of you that have been around this a little bit, you know that there is common stock and preferred stock. But I'm going to dig fairly deep on preferred stock because I think that's a less understood instrument. And it's particularly important for entrepreneurs because this is a investment vehicle used by private equity firms. So if you are ever considering either a partial sale, maybe bring in some cash or cash for growth, or maybe even a total sale. Um, and I'll talk about a total sale in a little bit because a total sale in, in their view is usually not a total sale, particularly if you're going to hang around. Um, you need to understand the ins and outs of private equity because this is the way that the private equity firms use to gain control, to gain uh, preference, uh, to kind of get to the front of the line. Um, and, you know, sometimes that can have tragically bad consequences for you as the entrepreneur. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. This is also relevant for anybody who's sort of in an early stage company because preferred equity is used all the time in early stage. And um, again, it can have really odd and complicated uh, outcomes if you are not careful. And even you may not have a choice, at least you know what you're signing up for, because sometimes people don't really understand it and they're a little surprised uh, at the outcomes they get. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of all of that. So let's start with common stock. I mean, we all kind of know what common stock is. If I buy common stock, I have a little piece of a company. I get a vote. Um, you probably are we're in a season where we're all getting our uh, requests for voting for annual meetings. Um, and you get you, you get a say in the company at some level, particularly when things are put to shareholder votes, like in publicly traded companies, that might be um, executive compensation it is beginning to be put to, to shareholder vote nowadays, as well as maybe some other things. Uh, well, you get to vote for your board of directors who represent your interests on the company and so forth. Um, and if there's, you know, dividends, meaning the company does well, um, then you get a share of those dividends, right? So my, I, you know, I manage some money for my mother and we just put her in a bunch of dividend paying stocks. She has common stock, but she gets a dividend on her ownership of that stock every year, provided, you know, of course, that the company does well. And the, and the dividend in that case is not guaranteed or anything. It's if we do well, you do well. If we do bad, you do bad. Um, yeah, I think some of these companies hesitate to drop their dividend rate because it can hurt their share price. But uh, generally speaking, you are at risk on your dividend. Um, and in the early stage, when we're raising money, um, and I've been involved in a couple recently, the, you know, as the founder, you normally issue to yourself and or your management team common stock. That's kind of the way we do it. We don't play any funny games with preferred stock or anything like that. And, you know, when you bring in your friends and family, your first round of money, your first half a million or million, and you got Uncle Bob and, you know, your neighbor and a few other people coming in, normally you are selling them common stock when you do that. In other words, they look just like you, which seems, you know, fair enough. And I actually had one company I was involved in where, um, I was able to get away with common stock the entire time, even with external investors. So they were kind of high net worth individuals that put the money in. Um, and um, so we were able to sell them common stock and there was no preference. But preference is a thing, particularly if you get to slightly bigger numbers or you involve professional money. So this would be venture capitalists or, or private equity groups. They, they like they like 
they like preferred shares like, you know, koala bears like eucalyptus leaves. They, this is like their favoriteest, favoriteest thing in the whole wide world, pretty much. And, and you'll know why when I'm done talking about it, because it gives them all kinds of rights and privileges that you don't get with common shares. So the first sort of fundamental thing that you get with preferred is that you are in front of the line in terms of getting paid out. So you're preferred, right? You are get the VIP line, if you will. And so when there are dividends, you get first. So if the dividends are enough to pay everybody something, then you know all good. If the dividends are not enough to pay everybody, preferred gets paid, common doesn't get paid. And so there have been situations where you know they had an okay year, preferred got their money because they are preferred, common got nothing. And that happens all the time in the case of dividends. And normally there is a dividend rate on, on preferred shares. Um, not always, let me just say, but many times there are, particularly if you're a cash flow positive business, they might say, look, we're going to put the preferred shares in and we're going to get an 8% dividend rate or 7% dividend rate. It won't look like bank debt. It'll be more expensive than bank debt, but it is different than debt because you don't have all the covenants and you don't have to talk to the bank and, but it does come with some other things that you talk about, but dividends is one thing. Um, and Usually that's in cash on an annual basis. Now, many times they go, look, tell you what, we want our dividends, but we know that you need your cash. You know, you want to grow the business. We want you to have the cash to grow the business, to make this thing more valuable for all of us. And so they'll do what's called uh, cumulative uh, preferred stock or pick. And pick is called payment in kind. And what that means is, there's two ways that that looks. Either A, they go, look, don't pay me my 8% dividend. Just throw it on top of the pile of whenever there's a transaction, you owe me what I put in plus my 8% for whatever number of years you didn't pay it to me. So, you know, my $1 million turns into, you know, $1.2 million because you owe me some interest that you've never paid me. And I was okay with that, but I'll get paid when we sell the company. The other way that this is done, payment in kind or pick, when people talk about picking the interest, you may have heard that phrase before. That means kind of put it at the end, right? Pay out at the end. Um, the other way it's done is they go, look, we'll pick it and you can pay me in more shares. So this, I got to just warn you on this one. People propose it. It is insidious in terms of diluting your ownership over time. Um, uh, Einstein said that... Um, uh, that interest was the most powerful force in the universe. And he may have been right about that. But the idea of compounding interest and the impact on their value versus your value, particularly if you don't sell quickly, like let's say three, four, five years, you're going to be shocked at how much you owe your preferred shareholders when the time comes. So be really careful about picking in the form of stock as opposed to picking in the form of cash prefer to do it in cash if you can get away with it. There is also a bit rarer um, preferred, which is non-cumulative. So we, we've been talking about cumulative preferred stock. Non-cumulative means if we can't pay you one year your dividend, then it just goes away and we don't owe it to you. Now, you know, no private equity, you know, MBA worth their salt is going to want that one, but um, it does exist. It's out there. You may hear about it at some point. Um, the other thing you get and this is where it starts to get a little tricky, is in the case of preference, you, when there's a, a distribution of assets, meaning we sold the company or we got a big payout or something, they go for, well, first debt, of course, debt goes first. But then second is the preferred shareholders. And then third are the common shareholders in terms of who gets paid. Um, and, you know, so what that means is, and, and, and that's just straight, preferred, which is, again, a little less common. Normally, what you'll get what's called uh, participating preferred, which I'll talk about in a minute. So let's say they put a million dollars in your business, and uh, you've picked a bunch of interest because you haven't paid them. They go, all right, you sold the company for $10 million. We get our million off the top, plus we get our interest, and then see you later. That's it. Less common. That kind of looks like debt, really, right? I mean, you got to pay the, the the capital off plus the interest you owe them, and then they go away. That's essentially preferred, looking like a bond almost. But that's not what the private equity firms normally want, or venture capitalists would normally want to put into your business. 
what they want is called participating preferred. So it'd be, uh, they would call it um, cumulative participating preferred. So it accumulates interest if there is any. Most of the time they do this, um, what they call participating preferred when it's, you're not gonna flow any cash. There aren't gonna be any dividends. So there's no like ongoing payment to them. So they go, look, we're gonna get it all on the backside. So it's gonna be juicy for us if we do that. And what that means, participating preferred, what that means is they participate in the up, not only do they all get all of their cash off the table, they participate in the upside that has been created while you use their cash, participating preferred. So an example is, let's say it's what they call a, a and then they call this a liquidation preference. So let's say they have a 1X liquidation preference and they put a million dollars into your business and they own 10% of your business, okay? So first you, you sell the business for 10 million bucks like I talked about before. The first thing that happens is you pay off your debt. Let's assume you don't have any. Then you pay the, the million dollars of preferred stock off. Boom, there's now $9 million left. Now they participate just like Common does and they own 10% of the company. So they get 10% of the $9 million left. So they get $1.9 million out. And you know they all get giddy and give themselves high fives and pay each other bonuses when this happens because they gave you a million and they got a million nine back hopefully over not a real long period of time, maybe two, three years, that'd be a really happy outcome. So that's how participating preferred works. They get paid first and then they participate like common. Now I talked about a one X, X liquidation preference, but that's not the only kind there is. Um, some smart MBA came up with the idea of, well, geez, if one is good, 1.5 is better. So in that case, you sell the business for $10 million, they get a million and a half liquidation preference, and then they participate like common. So they'd get a million and a half off the top, and then 10% of the 8.5 million that's left for $2.35 million. Well, that's a really happy moment for the private equity firm. You do okay, but they do great for the money they put in. Then some other smart guy said, well, if 1.5 is good, then two is even better or 2.5, and I've seen them as high as three, which is obscene, but um, it exists. So just look for this, right? They're gonna, you're gonna hear the term participating preferred with a liquidation preference, a 1.5 liquidation preference. That's what this means. They're gonna get paid first and then they're gonna participate, but they're gonna get paid 1.5 times their money back. Um, you know, it happens and sometimes you gotta have the money and you don't have a choice, but just realize that's what's involved. But let's. So why do they do that? Well, first to juice their returns, right? That makes all kinds of sense, right? If I, if I put in a million and I get 2.35 back, that's a happy, happy day for an investor, for them and their investors. But it also gives them downside protection. So I'll give you an example of a company I've been involved in. Um, they have over time brought in, um, doo -doo -doo, I'm going to say $90 million of capital from private equity firms. And that has a 1.25 preference on it. So they owe those guys like, I don't know, one point, but we'll call it $115 million, right? For the preferred. Well, it turns out they've had a little bit of distress and it's time to sell the company. And it looks like they're gonna sell the company for, I don't know, who knows, 40, $50 million. Let's say 50 million bucks, right? Well, watch what happens. They pay off their debt. 5 million bucks, something like that, $45 million left. The $45 million, every nickel of it goes to the preferred shareholders and the common gets nothing. So if you were the founder of that business, blood, sweat, tears, multiple years, grew it to something, it ended up having a little distress, you time for a liquidity event, you're going to get 50 million bucks of the business, sounds like a pretty good payday for everybody, and you, for your fine work, will get absolutely nothing. And the preferred shareholders will get all the money. Now, if you look at it from their point of view, they go, well, you know, I get that we get all the money, but don't forget, I gave you $90 million. I'm only getting 45 back. So I'm only getting a 50 cents on the dollar back. It's not like I'm real happy about that answer. It's better than zero, but I sure don't want to share it with anybody else if I don't have to. So it is downside protection as well as upside juice which is why uh, private equity firms like this so much. In fact, I was in another 
transaction where effectively the same thing's happening, that the common will get nothing. It's a merger, cashless merger. Common will get nothing and um, preferred will get all the shares of the subsequent entity because of the value of the deal as it transacts. So um, heads up, that's what's ex exposure. Um, you know, in this participating pr preferred, you'll hear about conversion rights. And essentially it really is two things. It's preferred stock and conversion rights together. That's what makes it participating preferred. So you may hear the idea of conversion rights, but it's really embedded in this idea of participating preferred stock. Um, the other thing you may see, and there are other rights that they like to slap onto these preferred. I talked about kind of the biggest one there, right? That they get paid first and they participate going forward. There are other rights that you may see people trying to stick into your preferred stock if they're putting it into your business. One is anti-dilution rights. Now, anti-dilution means if you go raise more money, this is particularly true in growth companies, right? Let's say they get 10% of the company and they go, uh, yeah, but it's anti-dilutive, meaning you, and, and sometimes it's like forever anti-dilutive. Sometimes it's for the next round, it's anti-dilutive. But let's say um, it's forever, just for grins. They go, all right, uh, we put a million bucks in and we get 10%. And then you go raise $20 million because you're doing really good and you're going to grow the company to $100 million. They go, awesome. All of the dilution, all of the loss of ownership you have to give up to bring in that $20 million, that happens to everybody else, but not us. So the 90% shareholders, all the common effectively, they take 100% of the dilution to bring in the $20 million. The preferred shareholders sit there happy as clams, and they don't have to take any of the dilution. So non-dilutive or anti-dilution provisions if you can avoid signing an anti-dilution provision, I would absolutely recommend doing it. On the other side, if anybody offers you non-dilutive stock, like take it and run like you stole it. I mean, like it is a really good thing to have if you can get it, but try to avoid it if you're bringing money into your company because basically that means all of the burden of future fundraises on you and the other common shareholders, which you really don't want. Um, the other things you'll see is a uh, right of first offer and right of first refusal. And what that means is, um, we'll take the second one first, right of first refusal. So let's say somebody says, hey, I, I want out. I want to, and this is in a private company mostly. I want to sell my shares. Time for me to get out. I'm kind of done on this deal. They, the preferred shareholders, have the first right to buy those shares, right? They have the first right to buy. And they have to be valued. But they can say, hey, at that number, I'm buying all those shares. This is particularly if they like your story and they like your position and they're happy where it's going. They may say, look, if I can get more of it, I'll take more of it. And I've been in a couple of deals where that's exactly right. You know, you got a shareholder would like to concentrate their ownership. They'd like to grow their position. And somebody says they want out. They go, look, I'll take you out. I'll be the buyer. I'll be the market to take you out. It's kind of on one level, it, you don't care. They do it to protect their interests so that, um, People they don't know don't end up in the deal. Uh, they have an opportunity to concentrate their ownership um, and gain more control over the deal. So that's not that painful a phrase, but you may see it or a term, you may see it. Um, right of first offer is if, let's say you go, hey, we need to go raise more money and we're going to sell another $5 million of the company and we're going to sell you know 10% of the company for the $5 million. Particularly if you're doing well, this right of first offer is they go, if you're doing that raise, we're going to take it all or we'll take a big chunk of it, which is kind of cool from a money raising point of view. You go, my current shareholders took half my raise out before I even went to market, shows how confident they are in my company. And you can jump in. It's an opportunity for you to jump in that may not exist in the future. So off you go. But you know that's a way for them to protect. If they don't have an anti-dilution uh, right, They'll want that because if they don't want to get diluted, they're going to have to put some more cash in to maintain position. Um, and we've all had, I think we've all had uh, capital calls and the call goes, hey, um, we need to raise $5 million or go into current shareholders. You guys have right of first offer. Um, if you don't want to get diluted, here's how much of this offer you need to buy. And I've, I've participated in a bunch of those over time. 
Uh, they're usually a smaller number than your initial investment, but it allows me to maintain my ownership percentage if that's what I want to accomplish. So write a first offer. Again, not a painful phrase. We're fine. Um, you, can, uh, you can sign that one and be okay with it usually, unless you're really unhappy with your current preferred shareholders and you really don't want them to own more, more of your company, then you may not want to sign that term. Um, so unfortunately you're signing it when you're in the honeymoon period and you know, everything's uh, unicorns and rainbows. So you don't know they're going to be jerks until later. And, uh, by then you've already agreed to it. So that can be a little bit of a problem. Um, those are some of the financial terms you see there, there are others of course, but I'm talking about the major ones. I don't want to go too deep into this, but preferred stock and what it's used for and, and the terms they put into it is, is really only limited by like the creativity of the financier. And, and this really evolved in an era when private equity was about financial engineering. Um, there was a view, and, and some private equity firms still hold it. They go, look, if we engineer this deal right, financially speaking, we don't care how well the company does, we'll make our return. So go back to my original firm, right? They go, hey, we're going to buy 10% of your $10 million company. We get a 1.5 liquidation preference, and then we participate, right? You go, awesome. Well, three years later, you haven't grown a whit. You're still worth $10 million. Nothing's changed. The company has not done particularly well. And we go, all right, time to sell it. So remember, we sell it for $10 million, right? Same as we, they came in at three years earlier, because we didn't do so good. They get $1.5 million, plus they participate. So they get $2.35 million, and the business didn't improve a nickel in that period. And that's what I mean by financial engineering. You'd say, Ideally, I'd like my investors to be aligned with me. Like if I do good, they do good. But they have engineered it, financially engineered it in a way that I don't actually care if you do good. If you do good, it's better. Love that. But I actually don't care because I've set it up so that I win no matter what. And so that's sort of how this is used. Now, it's slowly changing. Uh, private equity firms are saying, hey, it's not all about financial engineering. So you're seeing a little bit less of this kind of engineering in place, although it still exists. And they go, look, we actually have to help you get better. And that way, our interests are more aligned. And some of the more enlightened private equity firms are you know, making that their pitch. Uh, unfortunately, the less enlightened ones say the same thing. They just don't do it. <laughs> so you got to be really careful about who your partner is on this deal um, because they can structure it so your interests are actually not fully aligned in a way you'd like them to be. The other things you'll see them coming forward with when you come in with preferred shares are um, voting rights. And this is important. This is a modification of the operating agreement and maybe your board. Um, so first is if you don't have a board, you're going to have a board. So they will insist on a board being formed if there is not a board. Um, they will also insist, depending on the magnitude of the investment, that they get, let's say, two out of five seats. Now, it, that's for a minority investment. If it's a majority investment, they'll want three out of five. And so they will control your board in a majority investment. In a minority investment, they'll have a very loud voice on your board. Um, and so just be heads up. They're going to be. They're, they're going to want to be on the board. They're going to want to be involved in, at that level. And, and usually they'll appoint somebody from their firm to sit on your board. Um, like many consulting deals, and, and we've got, um, we have a client that we worked with where he had a, a very, very notable, I won't mention their name, a private equity firm come into his, his deal and put a bunch of money to work. And, and the partner was awesome, super smart, got the deal, understood what was going on, new business, really brilliant guy. And uh, when the deal got signed, that was the last time they saw that guy. And uh, you know, two months later at the first board month member, um, Skippy rolls in uh, with the, uh, the ink on his Harvard MBA bear, still wet, and he's gonna be your new board member. And you know, that is a lovely education for Skippy, but it can be very painful as an entrepreneur who's been doing this for 10 or 20 years, you'd be answering Skippy's questions, which you will be doing. So just heads up, you're going to get a board member. It may not be the board member you want, and you will not have control over it. They get to a point. You don't get to a point. Now, you can whine and complain, and which my client did, and it didn't change. <laughs> so um, just heads up, that may happen. 
Um, the other thing they'll do is with regard to voting rights, they may ask for changes in, um, in the rules of how we vote on stuff. Um, we call that um, minority position with majority like control provisions. So they won't be able to say yes to anything, but they can say no to lots of stuff. So they might say, look, we're going to put two people on the board, which means they got 40% of your board. They go, look, for really big stuff, we really need to have two-thirds majority say yes to things at the board level. And you go, well, two-thirds sounds reasonable for big stuff like selling the company or raising more equity or selling debt or selling part of the company or changes the executive payroll or you know, a bunch of important things like that. And you go, sounds all right. And then you do the math. You go, wait a minute. I've got three seats. They've got two seats, which means if it's 66%, if they don't vote for it, it doesn't happen, which means they have blocking rights on all kinds of interesting stuff. So that's a very typical thing that you'll see in preferred shares. It's not in the share construction. It's in the modification of your operating agreement and your board composition as a result of taking the money. So just heads up, that is a likely outcome. You can try to negotiate this down, um, but it is an absolute go-to play that you're going to be dealing with. And then maybe the final thing that you need to be aware of, and this is not quite as onerous, but it can be, uh, is information rights. It is pretty typical that preferred shareholders have information rights. So if you're not accustomed to giving quarterly financial reports, uh, quarterly letters from the CEO to explain what's going on in the business, maybe quarterly sit downs with the preferred shareholders for an hour to answer questions, there's a good chance that you're going to end up with that. Now, being on the board, solves part of the information rights. You can say, I'm giving you the stuff I give to the board and that's it. I'm not giving you any more. Um, but you do need to, you know, uh, there's a, a psychologist who talks about good relationships, a guy named John Townsend. says good relationship have ships have boundaries. So you they'll push until you say you've hit the boundary. This is how far I'll go and no further. And you know, many times that'll be respected, although not always. I can give you an example though. Sometimes information rights get I'm going to say kind of stupid and stupid in this regard, your financial team ends up spending a lot of time answering questions, but from your preferred shareholder, it happens all the time. Um, and so I've had clients go, you know, where they're answering three significant questions a week. Hey, what if we uh, slice the revenue by customer, by margin, and analyze the, the sales costs and tried to figure out which customer is most profitable? Hey, did we ever do a geographic concentration analysis on our clients? Hey, did we ever, like, did we ever look at you know, uh, purchase price from our suppliers to see if they're like, you can imagine, this is again, only limited by creativity and imagination, how many questions. Um, I'll tell you that I, I, had a, I had a boss like this once ages ago. Uh, he had more questions than you could imagine. And I finally explained to him the Chinese expression, which is a, uh, a fool can ask more questions than a wise man can answer. And so this is sort of the theme of this whole conversation that you may have an, somebody who really doesn't understand your business, doesn't understand the market, doesn't understand what's going on, asking a gajillion questions that you then got to answer. And that takes a lot of time, effort, you can chew up a lot of CFO time, analyst time. So heads up, I've had clients that finally said, look, enough, we're going to let you into our data room. We're going to let you into our, our business intelligence tool, and you can slice and dice the data any way you want. We're no longer answering your questions, which is not an unreasonable answer. They're not trying to hide anything. They just didn't want to do the work anymore. And so that can happen as well. So I think that's kind of most of it on preferred equity, the financial terms around it, um, the, the, the voting and information rights that you may have to deal with preferred shareholders. But, but just be really aware. And the reason why I thought this is worth talking about is I have you know, two transactions I'm involved in, both of which all of, and this is a, both a little bit distressed, but both of which the preferred shareholders are going to end up with everything. And the common shareholders will end up with nothing. And in both cases, the founders had common shares. Because, you know, why would you issue yourself preferred shares, right? And, uh, and so for all their work, all their effort, they're going to they're gonna post a zero. And that kind of stinks. So I wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Um, go for there. I, I will tell you that I did, I did pull one time. I had a, a private equity firm coming in. And they said, well, we're, of course, we're going to want preferred shares. I said, sure, no problem. 
But the minute you do, I'm going to issue an equivalent amount of preferred shares for everybody else in my capital stack. So we're all preferred. Well, the minute you're all preferred, there's no preferred, right? <laughs> so um, that kind of ended that conversation about having preferred shares because I wasn't, frankly, I wasn't willing to do it. So, so that's kind of preferred shares. That's what to think about. That's what to worry about. That's what to sign and what not to sign or what to sign and be worried that you signed it. Um, but I wish you good luck. Um, maybe you're a little more knowledgeable going into this. Just remember, you know, this may be the first time you've done this. It'll be the 37th time that the private equity firm has done it this year. So you, um, it's not a fair game. So on that note, I wish you good luck. I wish you good growth. And I will see you next time on the Lazy CEO Podcast. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by the CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.